on this episode of The Journal, Magic Card Games, Online Hockey Coaching, The Dilemma of Becoming an Adult, and our feature on Drag Queens. Don't stop watching. Welcome to the journal. I'm your host, Arad Bagarpur Asvandi. Today we'll be showing you four documentaries directed and produced by students in Centennial College's broadcasting program. We also have a performance from students in our music performance program. Marcus, Natalie, and guitar player Adam, at the end of today's show, will perform for us. We are also featuring one of our documentary filmmakers, Matt Atia, in a one-on-one -on -one interview. So before we kick off the show, just a reminder for you guys to stick around until the end. Later on, we have Jay and Magic, a story by Devin Williamson that takes you into the world of role-playing magic card games. We also have The Sounds of Hockey by Matt Atiyah, about a hockey coach who runs a YouTube hockey training channel. Finally, our featured doc, Drag Me to Church Street, takes an in-depth look at the world of drag and cross-dressing. Produced by today's showrunners, Justin Fontenelle, Gabby Salon, and Liam Mitchell. That all sounds exciting, right? Each one of these documentaries have something different to offer, and they all tell their own distinctive stories. Anyway, coming up now, we have What's Next, a documentary by Emily Skeffington, who is also today's show director. Without further delay, here's What's Next by Emily Skeffington. I think with adulting, the thing is people go to study whatever their parents want them to do or what other people are studying and they're not really sure whether or not that's the career they want. I think that's the major thing. I know so many people that go back to school for something else because once they're in the field that they graduated from, they realize that that's not really what they want. Since graduating, I've been balancing two part-time jobs. One is in my field and the other isn't. Um, my first job is as a customer service representative at a grocery store, and the other is as a respite instructor for people with special needs. Since graduation, I've been doing my apprenticeship two weeks after I graduated. Uh, my life's changed because, you know, I'm working full-time instead of going to school. I think the hardest part was trying to decide whether or not I could do this job for the rest of my life. Um, after graduating college, I immediately got a job with my field placement and about a year into it I really started to think about whether or not I could do this for the rest of my life and even now I still think about that. I'm still trying to decide. Uh, the hardest part's probably been trying to balance personal life and work life. I'm always, during the week there's just no time or energy to do anything and then on the weekends you want to try and cram everything in but you also want to try and catch up on sleep. So the hardest part's been trying to balance the two. Learning to accept that everything happens at your own pace. I compared myself a lot to my friends who had full-time careers right after graduating university and I wasn't there yet because I didn't know what I wanted to do. So it was kind of sad but at the same time it gave me motivation to go after what I wanted but I still had to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, the hardest part has probably been like knowing all my all my friends are in school and none of them are really working full time so it's, they're all going out during the week or on weekends and I just wanna I wanna go out and do stuff with them but I just don't have the energy or the time to be doing it so it's kinda I guess made me sad but there's it's just, I'm still working towards trying to find that balance to make it better I think I would just say take your time if you need time to figure out what you wanna do take that time think about it because ultimately it is your future and you should be happy with what you decide to do there you have it, folks. That was What's Next by Emily Skeffington. Be on the lookout for her other documentary, The Team, that will be featured on our end of the year award show. Let's get back on topic. Five fun facts about adulting. One, did you know one of the biggest obstacles millennials face when adulting is not having a summer break? Ooh, I kind of had a hunch, but that's just me. Two, 
partying on Friday nights turns into stay at home and order pizza and watch Netflix. That is a fact I can wholeheartedly agree with. Me and my girlfriend sometimes do that and other stuff. Three, keeping on track and paying bills. That's a tough pill to swallow. Sorry, kids. Cell phone bills isn't the only thing you'll need to worry about. And four, take your first steps to parenthood by getting a pet. I personally have a cat. Uh, meow. Five, purchasing a file cabinet solely for storing away all your documents. Let's hear it, Gen Xers. Do you have a filing cabinet? If so, follow us on Instagram at the underscore journal 2017 or follow us on Facebook at the journal 2017. Back after this. Welcome back. Coming up next, we have Jay and Magic, a documentary about the role-playing card games Magic the Gathering, produced by our student, Devin Williamson. We've certainly come a long way from Dungeons and Dragons, but that's what's really interesting, that a lot of people now like to get together in person to play these role-playing tournaments. Let's take a look at Jay and Magic. How you doing? My name is Jay and I am a Magic player. I got into Magic probably when I was about 15, 16 years old in high school. You know, uh, lots of spare times where uh, in the cafeterias with my buddies and just learning a new game. So I go to, occasionally I do go and play at face to face. Um, I go there with a couple of my friends, uh, Kyle being one of them. Um, I do go to other uh, venues as well to play, but m occasionally more in face-to-face. -face. Uh, I would definitely recommend, recommend Magic the Gathering to uh, anyone who's uh, interested in picking up a new game. I find that um, you, know, you, it will, you will meet a lot of new people. You will meet a lot of people that are willing to help. My name is Kyle. Um, I play Magic and I come to face-to-face -face and other uh, hobby stores to meet up with like-minded players and I've met a couple of friends and started a community and that's how I met Jay. Uh, we worked together and we bonded over magic cards. Just like any other hobby, it is a very costly hobby if you do intend to stay in it for a long time. It's a $9,000 card. Why is it $9,000? It's like it's like the, Kelly likes to say, it's like the Wayne Gretzky rookie card. So it, no one actually would ever play with this in a deck. It is designed to be something you put on your mantelpiece. There's some, some people who like treat this like an investment in that, you know, I remember this was like $1,000 a couple years ago, $500 before that, it's gone up and it's gone up. But it's, as inflation happens, they get rare, they get lost, they get damaged. What's it in now? Uh, 9,000 this one here. This one's actually pretty beat. If this was in like fully mint condition, I could expect it to go for 15 to 20 thousand dollars. All right, so uh, this is face to face. This is uh, where I come to play and uh, where I spent some of my time uh, here playing with my buddies and a couple of other people in the community. Uh, hope you guys enjoy. It's a really nice place to, uh, you know, to socialize and you get to meet a lot of new people and um, yeah, hopefully you guys come down here on your own. That was Jay and Magic, a documentary by Devin Williamson, an aspiring DOP and one of our favorites, Behind the Lens. They say Magic cards originated in the University of Pennsylvania. Richard Garfield, who was a doctoral candidate at the university, began creating the game on his spare time in 1991, the year yours truly was born. Soon after, he was able to get a group of friends to join in on the game, and they would host gatherings at the university, thus getting the name Magic Hearts Gathering. 
interesting, right? But that's not all for what we have today. We still have a special performance by Marcus, Natalie, and Adam, a sit down with Matt Atia and our featured documentary, Drag Me to Church Street. You're watching The Journal. Stay tuned for more after the break. Have you ever been at a hockey rink all by yourself at the crack of dawn, skating on that brand new fresh ice? Well, do you recall how your skate blades made that neat slicing sound? You're going to love this next documentary. Coming up, we have Sounds of Hockey by Matt Atia, And stay tuned for a special interview with Matt after the story. Everything else in the world kind of just disappears. It's something I think must be truly unique to hockey. It's, it's just the game for, you know, however long that game lasts, one hour that you're out on the ice, just nothing else matters. My name is Jeremy Repke. I'm from Huntsville, Ontario, and I uh, run How To Hockey. It's a website, YouTube channel, social media, sort of platform to help anyone, anywhere learn how to improve their hockey skills. Thinking about what made me the person I am today, uh, a lot of it comes from, I guess, my upbringing. Uh, both good experiences and bad experiences, they both have, you know, both sides have sort of shaped, uh, I guess, why I am. And the, the longer I continue doing what I do, the more I can kind of look back and appreciate that those moments were the moments that shaped my life. I think uh, the biggest one was just not having, I guess, um, a perfect upbringing in hockey. I didn't have really good coaches. I was never on the same team. We moved a little bit back and forth. Uh, some years we couldn't afford to put me in uh, hockey, so I had to just kind of teach myself. So I was very passionate, but I didn't really have the support or the coaches throughout my entire, uh, I guess, like childhood to really get that support to become a good hockey player. In, in my opinion, the mindset you have going into something is really important because if you don't truly believe in yourself, then you're not going to have the results even doing the exact same amount of work as somebody who really believes that they are going to improve and, and be better, if someone else is going without that belief, then they're not going to try as hard. They won't be as motivated to keep on continuing. If they have a few failures, they're probably going to give up. So having that mindset that you will succeed right off the start and believing in yourself is really important because you don't see mistakes as failures. You see them as a necessary step to uh, achieving something. So I think it's really important to, to have that uh, growth mindset. Uh, when it comes to people who want to start playing hockey but have never played before, I'd say the biggest one is just start. Start with what you have or what you can kind of manage. You don't have to go out and buy all the gear and sign up for a team. Maybe it's just getting a stick and joining a ball hockey league. And there you're going to meet some people who probably play ice hockey as well and you can make a few friends. So you can work within the community and eventually build your way up to getting on the ice. If you have challenges, like you are just completely lost, I've got tons of videos online so you, know, you can get an idea of what you need to learn to learn how to skate and shoot and stick handle. Public skating is pretty cheap so you can learn to skate. And if you still love it a year later, you'll probably have picked up some stick handling, shooting and skating skills and you could probably join a team and before you know it, you'll be a hockey player. That was Sounds of Hockey by Matt Atia. I just want to take a moment and thank all of our viewers online for tuning in today. Anyways, with us, as I said, is Mr. Matt Atia. How are you doing today, Matt? Pretty good, you? Yeah. Not bad, not bad. So, Matt, what was your inspiration behind this beautiful piece? So, my inspiration behind this piece was basically I was hit up by a friend, Daniel, and uh, he was the one that came up with the idea. And basically what we wanted to do was make a video and like heavily incorporate a lot of sound design because uh, there isn't a lot of videos that focus on sound design a lot. So like a lot of people say it's 50% audio, 50% vi visuals, but like to be honest, we think it's more than that. So that was sort of our inspiration behind it. 
Okay. What are some equipments you use to shoot this dog? So what we used to shoot this was two cameras, an A6300 uh, Sony and a Sony A7S, uh, as well as a zoom mic and like a high-end shotgun, shotgun mic. Okay. So can you take us through the post-production process and how it helped us get to this stage? Uh, so for post-production, we were actually like really unorganized. What happened was we didn't slate anything or like have any sort of markings for audio. Since we had external audio, um, like the clips were all over the place and stuff like that. And we had two cameras, so there was like two angles of everything, like audio uh, for everything. So it was just like really unorganized. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. I feel you. So um, if I'm if I'm not wrong, a version of your documentary got picked up by TSN. Uh, yeah, so what we did was we took all the B-roll clips and we threw it into like sort of a montage with music for people to watch and uh, the guy in the documentary, Jeremy, he posted it on his YouTube and then TSN picked it up and they wrote an, a little article about it, posted it on Facebook and it ended up getting like 65,000 views. So, wow, Congratulations, yeah, that's pretty cool. Thanks. Um, are you going to continue with this series? Are you going to make Sounds of Football, Sounds of Skiing? Or anything like yeah, that? we definitely thought about like continuing it. It's just right now we're a little busy and it's like kind of been on hold. But uh, yeah, we definitely want to do like there's some crazy sounds out there that we could like record that are associated with cool visuals. So we could definitely do something with this series. So of course, of course. Um, where can people go to see more of your videos? Uh, so right now. Probably go to my Instagram, like that's the most popping right now. And also my website, matatia.com, if you want to check it out. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks a lot. And good luck on all your future endeavors. No the Journal will be back right after this. Toronto's downtown Church Street is a very lively scene, and one of the ma things that makes it a lively scene is drag queens. Drag queen is a form of entertainment widely known in the LGBTQ community. Drag Me to Church Street features two fascinating characters, a drag queen and a transsexual crossdresser, both of whom share intimate aspects of their lives. Here is producer Justin Fontenelle's Drag Me to Church Street on The Journal. My name is Fatality, I'm 24 years old, and I'm a graphic designer and a drag queen. I started getting to drag um, from um, acting high school. I majored in acting in high school, and going from that into graphic design, I kind of miss being on stage. Now, I guess this would be my own identity in terms of inspiration. I mean, RuPaul, you can always look up to Hall and stuff like that, but I mean, I kind of want to make my character my own. Cause just like seeing it all come together, that's the most unique. Like just seeing the lashes coming on. There's like that special moment when the lashes come on, the contours, and, and like finally get all my clothes right. I feel myself. It just feels perfect. Going to clubs, the gay guy, kind of, I kind of felt like, oh, I can do this. I looked sick as a kid. It felt natural to me. I think for me, every drag queen has their own unique style. I can't really judge them on that. But I mean, in terms of like drag queens that I know, like I love um, Sofana's creativity. That's something that I wish I had. Like Donna Emma and Sofana's creativity, but they can just come up with a number and come up with something on spot. It's just amazing.
for most of the time, drag queens are all gay men who want to impersonate female, who want to impersonate females. With cross dressers, most of the time, well, not always, it's heterosexual men who just want to just dress up, and that's all they want to do. There's transgender people, there's drag queens, and there's cross dressers. I just want to say as drag queens, we don't want to be women. At the end of the day, we just want to take all this stuff off and be gay men and just live our own lives. Hola, mi nombre es Alvio Baeza. Nada, tengo 30 años. Actualmente, este, pues, me gusta divertir, me gusta ser yo mismo, vivir la vida como, como soy, sin deberle ni preguntarle nada a nadie cómo se siente. Mi nombre de mujer es Alvia Marina. Me llamo así por Albio, que es mi original nombre. Eh, Marina porque me gustó, porque eh, lo que me gusta de ser Albia Marina es que he podido ver que soy más feliz. Me siento, me siento yo, me siento más desenvuelto siendo Albia Marina. Me he sentido hasta, me, me he llegado a sentir hasta querida, deseada. O sea, muchos, muchos chicos quieren quedar conmigo como mujer. Cosa que nunca, nunca había vivido como Albio. Me siento actualmente mujer, tengo que aclarar eso, ¿no? No me siento una persona gay, no me siento gay. Porque yo desde la infancia siempre he tenido, siempre he tenido algo femenino en mí. Porque, o sea... Obviamente yo teniendo ya el cabello largo, pero eso yo lo, quiero, yo lo quiero hacer ya cuando yo haya empezado una transición. Porque yo no quiero verme tampoco como que, como travesti va, como me veo ahorita, por así decirlo. O sea, yo quiero verme mujer, o sea, yo quiero verme bien. Ya, o sea, que yo me pueda levantar y, y peinarme la cabellera larga, por así decirlo. O sea, tener, tener unos pechos ya puestos. Y, o sea, estar como, como, como un hombre quiere, como los, como un hombre quiere verme. Sin embargo, de lo que puedo decir que todavía siento un miedo. Eso es, que, eso es, eso es lo último en lo que quiero pensar por ahora. Pero de lo que sí estoy seguro es que yo quiero ser mujer y quiero lucir como mujer. ¿Sí? Entonces... Y vuelvo a repetir, ¿no? Estoy siendo yo misma y así yo lo quiero hacer. Y punto. That was amazing. Justin Fontanelle and co-producers Gabby Salon and Liam Mitchell have really given us a chance to get to know these characters. It is amazing to see that perspective of a drag queen behind the scenes and the transition from a man to a woman. Now, for the moment we've all been waiting for. From Centennial College's music program, here is second year students Marcus, Natalie and Adam. Enjoy. Till I have nothing left I'm not so strong Enough to take the stress I want it all. I may sound So I 
won't let go of you. My resolve is shaking. My heart was aching. But I made up my mind. Oh, even if I And if I could be so bold till the day I die, I'll breathe you. I'll never let you go. I'll never let you go. Amazing performance. That was beautiful, guys. Marcus, thank you. Amazing, Natalie, yeah. Adam, thank you so much. That, that was awesome. Well, that's all for today, folks. Thank you to all of our dog producers for these fascinating stories. But be sure to catch up with us on Facebook at the Journal 2017, on Instagram at the underscore Journal 2017, and email us at the Journal 2017 at gmail.com. Be sure to watch us every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for the next four weeks. We hope you enjoyed today's show for the journal. I'm your host, Arad Bagapur Azbandi. We'll see you next week.